Elder Oaks helped me because I trip so much. So. Um, that was so beautiful to hear from Miss Kathleen and to be in this incredible place. Um, I talked to the students a little bit and I said, tell me about your experience. And they said, in this place, it's cool to be kind. That's why we love it. And it touched my heart because there are not many places left in this world where it is cool to be kind. Um, all right. Josh and I have never practiced together, so we're here. Here. Wait. Got it. OK. And do I point here? Oh, thank you. Stay with me, because this technology is, is new. Um, I have heard about the beauty of the campus and the remarkable learning experience, but when we drove up, I didn't plan on feeling the campus. And I saw the night, and I saw the buildings, and I felt the spirit that was here. And it's interesting, before I start to present, or before we ever talk, um, I was reading the scriptures, and I just opened it this morning, and it was the brother of Jared. And he had such great faith that the Lord could not keep himself from seeing him. And I thought of, of the Knights. They had so much belief in this place and this community that they, they brought a dream to fruition. And it, this is the 20th year and the final year that she'll do this. And it was so beautiful. And um, she'll get another hand, but could we just give her a hand? She's such a remarkable. Thank you. So does Irene. It's not often you come to a place where it, there's such a tender feeling. It makes it harder to talk. When everyone's far away and they look like little dots, it's much easier. Um, I also know uh, with Elder Oaks, apostles of the Lord don't go places unless they're meant to be there. And um, I'm sure Elder Bednar talked about it, but you come for the one. And he will take you to the time and the place where you're supposed to be. So I, he might have used me as the vehicle, but Elder Oaks is here. So we might even get to hear from him. <laughs> Are you prepared? I wonder, are you ready? <laughs> OK. I, I come to you as a learner in process. Oh. And I chose this staying connected faith in every footstep um, because so many people at the current time are struggling with the gospel. And I want to talk about ways that we can just cement ourselves to it. I come to you as a learner in process with a hunger for truth and a desire to build the kingdom of God. I bring the perspective of a woman and the heart of a mother and the experience of a teacher. We are moving into new waters and difficult challenges. It's a time of turbulence, uncertainty, and trial. We're surrounded by so much information. It, it's almost painful to turn on the television. So we've kind of, we have a few minutes a day, but we're the internet, but there are multiple voices of confusion and questioning. The practices that sustained us previously may not be sufficient to take us into the future. Initially, I had written, the faith that sustained us previously may not be sufficient to take us into the future. It hurt Elder Oak's heart too much. He said, no, say practices. So I choose to speak on faith in every footstep because as we step into a future, it is not fully illuminated, and faith is necessary to take that step. We do not know what the Lord will need us to do or when he will call upon us to do it. It's a picture of David, of David and Goliath fame. But we have the assurance if we study and learn from sacred texts and under the direction of the Holy Ghost, we can proceed with assurance that God will direct us, similar to the young David who was sent by King Saul to slay Goliath. David said unto Saul, thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. David took with him no armor. And if you read that account, Saul, dre um, Saul dressed him up and it was so heavy, he couldn't even move. And he said, my armor will be the armor of God. David took with him no armor, 
He took his staff in his hand and chose him five smooth stones and his sling, and he drew near the Philistine. Have you ever wondered why David took five stones? If he trusted the Lord so much, why didn't he just take one? And I was reading with my grandchild, and they said, well, Grandma, that's four extra stones. And I thought, I thought, perhaps to preserve ourselves and our faith, it's necessary to prepare in multiple ways to meet the enemies that lie ahead. Joseph Smith taught, in knowledge there is power. God has more power than all other beings because he has greater knowledge. It stands to reason if we seek greater knowledge and experience, our personal spiritual powers will increase too. Prophets, if we listen and learn from them, and this is a time, I have to say, brothers and sisters, I don't know how much of that is happening, but they can prepare us for the challenges to come. I love Ezra Taft Benson. The advice he gave many decades ago is still pertinent. He wrote, today the world is full of alluring and attractive ideas that can lead even the best of our members into error and deception. Students at universities are sometimes so filled with the doctrines of the world, they begin to question the doctrines of the gospel. But we have no need to fear. And you know why we have no need to fear? The Savior himself said it when he gave his great discourse on the Mount of Olives. And whosoever treasureth up in my word shall not be deceived. Read your scriptures. Let's examine five spiritual connections we can make through study and learning and action that will reinforce and preserve us in the days ahead. I invite you to connect with our Savior Jesus Christ and learn and teach as he does. When we draw on the power of heaven to direct us, miracles happen. Learning, and, is, learning about the Savior is the highest form of study. There's a new church pamphlet, it's called Teaching in the Savior's Way, and I, I will be sharing with you something that Elder Callister, who put this together, shared. But in that pamphlet, it says, to be a Christ-like learner and teacher, perhaps the most important thing you can do is to follow the Savior's example of obedience and live the gospel with all your heart, at home, at church, and everywhere else. President Boyd K. Packer taught, power comes when a teacher learner has done all he can to prepare, not just the individual lesson, but in keeping his life in tune with the spirit. The more we try to be like our savior, the more we'll be able to teach and live like him. I'm going to quote from Neil L. Maxwell, but I have to tell you, he and Elder Oaks were so close. They drove to work together, and they said they could finish each other's sentences. And I said, aren't I supposed to do that? <laughs> but anyway, I, I wanted to quote. Every time I quote from Neil Maxwell, I think, finishing each other's sentences. <laughs> anyway, you teach what you are, Elder Neil L. Maxwell taught. Your traits will be more remembered than a particular truth in a particular lesson. This is as it should be, for if our discipleship is serious, it will show. Our goal is to study and learn to be like Christ, and the Savior himself has admonished us to do so. What manner of men ought ye to be? Verily I say unto you, even as I am. The gift to teach must be earned, and once it is earned, it must be nourished if it is to be kept. When we begin to analyze ourselves and look to improve ourselves as teachers, what better model could we find? What finer study could we undertake than to analyze our ideals and goals and methods and compare them with those of Jesus Christ? There is no information in print on how to teach moral and spiritual values more important, nor if properly approached, more helpful than is found in the Gospels. The teaching of Jesus Christ constitutes a treatise on teaching technique surpassed by none. 
Jesus has been described as a philosopher, an economist, a social reformer, and many other things. But more than these, the Savior was a teacher. If you were to ask, what did Jesus have as an occupation? There is only one answer. He was a teacher. It is he who should be our ideal. It is he who is the master teacher. The attributes which it has been my choice privilege to recognize in you, brethren and sisters, are no more nor less than the image of the master teacher showing through. I believe that to the degree you perform according to the challenge and charge which you have, the image of Christ does become engraven upon your countenances. And for all practical purposes, in that classroom at that time, and in that expression, and with that inspiration, you are He, and He is you. We teach what we are. Our conduct may determine whether those we teach accept or reject our words. Again, what manner of men, and we might say women, ought ye to be even as I am? President Spencer W. Kimball taught, you will do all you teach your students to do, to fast, to bear testimony, to pay tithing, to attend your meetings, to attend temple sessions, to keep the Sabbath day holy, to give church service ungrudgingly, to have home evenings and family prayers, and to keep solvent, and to be honest and full of integrity. In the course of my efforts to teach his gospel, I have come to know him, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the only begotten of the Father. I stand in reverence before him with deep regard for what he taught and with deep regard for how he taught. It is not untoward for any of us to aspire to teach as he taught. It is not untoward for any of us to aspire to be like him. He was not just a teacher. He was the master teacher. I chose to show that video because I think we won't just simply be teaching in church. The way, as we look out to the world, we're needed out there to teach what we know in our hearts every day and every way. And nothing could make us stronger than to be like our Savior, Jesus Christ. I invite you to connect with the Word of God and feast upon the words of eternal life. Elder Packer taught, this is Elder Oaks loves this, and true doctrine understood can change behavior. I also love that Elder Packer wrote, and this was um, about five years before he died, I do not fear the future. If you will feast upon the words of Christ, for behold, the words of Christ will tell you and your children as well all things what you should do. A knowledge of the restored gospel and a testimony of Jesus Christ can spiritually immunize your children. I love that, spiritually immunize us. I love also Ezra Taft Benson. The word of God is found in the scriptures, in the words of the living prophets, and in personal revelation. And brothers and sisters, when we have personal revelation, we should record it and keep records of it so that the people that come after us will know has the power to fortify the saints and arm them with the spirit so they can resist evil, hold fast to the good, and find joy in life. As we record in our journals and our diaries and letters and memories, we build hope for the future. In fact, we're admonished to keep such a record. It's just Elder Oaks is so good at it. He comes home and writes every week, and I go, honey, write for me. I'll tell you what to write. And I, I, I do keep a record, but nothing like his. But such a legacy of faith, constancy, service, and instruction can comfort, inspire, and motivate those who come after us. With the passing of Senator Robert Bennett, Elder Oaks and I read his words from the book, Why I Am a Mormon. It was sort of, and it was accidental, actually, because we were having a family home evening. 
and he had just passed away, and we wanted to be close to him. I share with you the words of Senator Bennett as he describes how he met the heavy demands of church, work, and family. I could not have done it without the constant support of the Lord, which was available to me through prayer. These are his words. In recent years, I have come again. I have again studied the Book of Mormon at length to see how it holds up half a century after the youthful enthusiasm of a 20-year-old missionary has died down. I've discovered much greater depth, wisdom, and power in it than I did before, giving me a new and deeper understanding of just what a miraculous scripture treasure it really is. It can pass the test that modern scholars apply to it, and it stands as a support for the Bible in a doubting age. Finally, Senator Bennett states, I am a Mormon because of the heft of sound scholarship reaffirms the sweet whisperings of faith. Most enlightening as we study that document, we discover ourselves and the depth of our souls. Elder Bruce R. McConkie, and I, I think of what a valiant, wonderful man Senator Bennett was, talks about other men that didn't have the scriptures in their lives. Stressed the importance of scripture study. He spoke of the learned men of the world. However talented men may be in administrative matters, however, however eloquent they may be in expressing their views, however learned they may be in worldly things, they will be denied the sweet whisperings of the spirit that might have been theirs unless they pay the price of studying, pondering, and praying about the scriptures. That it was so interesting that the word sweet whispering was used twice by such great men. Senator Bennett was a magnificent example of a learned man who depended on the Lord. Children are capable of understanding holy doctrine. Sister Cheryl Lamb, general president of the primary taught, children have an amazing capacity to understand the principles of the gospel. I want you to know that I know firsthand the effect of true principles on a young mind. I come from an amazing, terrific family, but not a religious family. My father was an Episcopalian, and my mother was a less active Mormon. There are reasons for that, because her mother had died and she had a stepmother, but the gospel was not taught or emphasized in my home. I was in a really wonderful Episcopalian home. Um, my contact with the church came with good friends who took me to Tuesday Primary, and I'm a 100 percenter, and to the weekly ward show. The, uh, the greatest tender mercy the Lord provided me was a home with a large, easily accessible library, and it had family history of my Mormon ancestors. Elder Richard G. Scott taught, knowledge carefully recorded is knowledge available in time of need. This practice enhances the likelihood of your receiving future light. Brothers and sisters, keep journals because I was the recipient of such recorded light. As a child of six, unbeknownst to my parents, I hungrily read the journals of a deceased grandfather and the stories of my lineage. I read of my widowed great-grandmother who was crossing the plains alone and blessing oxen. I read of a great-grandfather who went on a mission to Hawaii and loved the nation. I read of my own grandfather and their grandmother and their temple marriage and their love of the Savior. Those people I had never met became great teachers to me. Their journals and their records were a spiritual lifeline to a little girl who attended church alone, who ultimately begged to be baptized, and who supported herself when she was called on a mission. The people who came before me believed in the Lord, and it inspired me to believe that their faith had somehow transferred to me and made me capable of such faith, too. It's even re more remarkable to me that these journals nurtured a faith within me that enabled me to become the wife of an apostle of the Lord. As we study and learn, we are strengthened eternally. And I want to share with you for the coming messages. Today, the messages you hear are far more than intellectual exercises. Scholarship combined with a believing mind, have the potential to change our lives, and I testify of their power to do so. Oh, wait, wait, go back. 
I invite you to share truth and doctrine and expect miracles. Since the Holy Ghost is the teacher and learners are so diverse, we can expect other people to learn different lessons. It's interesting, whenever an apostle gives a talk and people will come up and their response about it is so totally different. Or when one of those beautiful songs were sung as today, people will take away different lines or different feelings about the effect of it. So whenever we teach, we never know what the response will be. But during our assignment in the Philippines, Elder Oaks and I came to realize that members in that nation learn best from demonstration and hands-on. We encouraged all who taught the gospel to show and not just tell. For instance, if Elder Oaks was going to tell them uh, about a mantle, he actually had someone come up and he put a coat on him and he said, you're now holding a new priesthood mantle and you're going to learn to grow into it. They're very, very literal people. But searching for a wife's present at a mission president seminar and using preach the, my gospel, I had an inspiration for a gift. And this is the gift. It's the testimony glove. And you see it, it's a glove that has five pictures on it. And those five pictures are pictures of what's asked when someone has an interview for baptism. The first one on the thumb is a picture of Joseph Smith seeing Heavenly Father, because we know we have a Heavenly Father who loves us and he's involved with us. The second is a picture of Jesus Christ, because we know Jesus Christ is our Savior and Redeemer. The third is Joseph Smith, who translated the Book of Mormon by the gift and power of God. The fourth is a picture of the temple and because the true church was restored. And Bruce R. McConkie said, if we don't know that the true church was restored, we don't have a testimony. And finally, a picture of our living prophet, Thomas S. Monson. Um, initially, we just made a few hundred for the mission presidents, and they were so well received. We got families with small children, who said they loved them, people who couldn't read, and those with no visuals of the church in their home. But letters kept pouring in, telling me of family conversions and members actually bearing testimony that they learned from the gloves. So after our mission in the Philippines, and I want you to look at this, I'll tell you about the pictures. Uh, as Elder Oaks and I traveled, I took gloves with me always to the mission president and they began to ask for more and to this date we've distributed about 250,000 of them you know I never thought I would be famous for a testimony glove you know <laughs> it's kind of like you don't know what your life is going to what direction but I want you to look at those pictures because Asia I was a missionary in Japan and you'll see a picture of the missionaries and the the boy not the fire boy with the brown hair but the other is Kyle Stevenson and he's Elder Stevenson's son and he, um, I have a picture of Japan because when Kyle was 12 he was my distributor in Japan and he gave out thousands and so when he was called on a mission to Taiwan and he, so he knew Japanese, now he's speaking Chinese. He distributed them there, and he wrote, and he said, Sister Oaks, please, they work, and send me some more. So this is very dear to me. They are used worldwide, and they're translated into over 20 languages. And I, I'm just so proud about that. I, I feel like a Mary Kay distributor. I don't know. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, it's been made into a book, and the book simply teaches doctrine and answers the five questions. And I have to tell you, I thought this is like the boring book. A Deseret book made it, and they said, this is pretty, it's doctrine, strictly doctrine. And they said, this is a boring book. And I said, I am not changing it because it's my book, and it's what happened. And so we're printing it this way. And to their surprise, <laughs> it was on the top seller list, number two, for three months. <laughs> behind Elder Oakdorf, but <laughs> I had to say that, but it did well. And, <laughs> and I said, you know what? People really like doctrine, <laughs> surprisingly. Anyway, other unexpected blessings came. Volunteers and young women and Relief Society sisters under the direction of Sister Joanne Phillips, who made the gloves for us, started telling us stories and one I wanted to share with you. A woman had her husband make the gloves and he'd been less active for 20 years. It's interesting, when you put on a picture of Heavenly Father, when you put on a picture of Joseph Smith and, and Jesus Christ, the touching of it changes you. 
But anyway, this woman had her husband making them, and their son was in a horrific bicycle accident. He was almost killed, and they went in and they gave him a priesthood blessing, and his life was spared. Now, I don't know the promises that the father made. I don't know anything. But Sister Phillips called me, and she said, Kristen, he came to church, and he used the glove. He hadn't been there for 20 years to bear a testimony of the truthfulness of the gospel. So I learned that contact with truth teaches truth. And it, it's just a, sort of like coming to this school. If you place yourself in an environment that's a holy environment, you become more holy. It's just the way it works. The testimony gloves were especially popular in Africa, where only men are taught to read colonial languages, English, French, and Portuguese, and women are not taught. In fact, it is the only area in the world where men outnumber women in active membership because of their ability to read. Africa kept asking for so many gloves, and I said, are you eating them? What's going on? I mean, <laughs> it was interesting. And the answer came back, and this is so touching, that mothers who were illiterate could, by only looking at the picture on the glove, teach their children a comprehensive testimony of the gospel. And they wanted more. They wanted to teach their children. Today I wish to share with you a letter I received from Sister Shauna Parmalee, the wife of the area president um, in South Africa, as she distributed gloves in Zimbabwe. It was during a time of great political unrest and armed conflict throughout the country. I, there are movies about it, but many people were expelled from their homes. They were slaughtered. They ran for their lives, and there was nationwide starvation. Email from Shauna Parmalee. And you can see the sisters in the audience. They have on their testimony gloves. I tell you something about the gloves in Zimbabwe. I took 200 gloves to the mission president's wife a year ago and asked her to distribute to one area of Zimbabwe that needed them. That was during a very, very hard political time, and people simply did not have food. There wasn't food on the shelves, and everyone was suffering. We had an auxiliary training meeting, and usually we get maybe 75. That day, we're 175, and she said, I am sure that many were not auxiliary workers. They had just come. We welcomed them with open arms. It was a very tender meeting. I skipped some of our plans for training and simply asked them how they were managing and handling this. One woman said, we don't worry about food tomorrow. We worry about finding food for today. Another stood and said, Heavenly Father is blessing us. These women are so strong and full of testimony and faith. I was so touched. One said, God helped me find a chicken yesterday because I paid my tithing. <laughs> I'm telling you, Kristen, the spirit was strong and my heart went out to these women who have nothing. And I remember Elder Holland had gone there and he came back and he said, they said, we're okay, Elder Holland. We are eating one meal a day. We're OK. Well, my heart was so touched, and I wanted to do something. So we gave each sister a testimony glove. They're not primary workers, but they are mothers who are having family home evening. We demonstrated how to use them, and then said each one would be able to have one if they would use them in primary or in their homes. They're used differently than we anticipated. But oh, what a sweet moment. It was so touching. I'm telling you, I was busy touching and putting my arm around these wonderful women. You could hear them sing in the end. The roof almost came off. It reminded me again how the African saints are the pioneers of Africa. It's been a privilege for me to teach and train. For me personally, it's given me great purpose. I think you can understand that. Thanks for the gloves. They made a difference. Love, Shauna. I love it because out of this act there was a serendipitous miracle when we're exposed to true doctrine it touches us it strengthens us and we can use it i love this because it, i'm going to quote my favorite scripture it's from the savior ether 12:27, and you're all familiar and if men come unto me i will show unto them their weakness that they may be humble and my grace is sufficient for all men that humble themselves before me and have faith in me. Then will I make weak things become strong unto them. On this day, these women left strengthened. 
I invite you to connect with those you love and inspire them to study and learn. Sister Rosemary Wixom counseled us, if, you do not, if we do not teach our children, the world will. And as our love increases for those around us, so does our desire to minister to them. Through priesthood ordinances, we're not only brought back to God, we're brought together through ceilings, genealogy, and family history. And the atonement broadens our concept of the resurrection and heaven as family events. When you take your sacrament, we're doing this as a family to be together forever. It is the literal binding together of generations of all families on earth and is unique to our faith. Elder Oaks and I sought for a means to spiritually unite and protect our family. We were inspired by the words of President Russell M. Nelson that no other work transcends that of righteous, intentional parenting. So we began by presenting an unusual Christmas gift to each person in our family. Our teaching tool of choice was the living Christ, a testimony prepared by the apostles as a gift to the world to celebrate the new millennium. We challenged our family members to memorize it. To our joyful amazement, over 30 members of our family took the challenge, young and old. What a gift it was to us and to them. Many reported more peace, less fighting, less irritation, jealousy, and concern. I should mention we did offer a reward. <laughs> um, yeah, um, we have a family dinner and a special certificate. It was no easy thing, and the three-year-old told her mother, don't ever make me do that again. <laughs> I'm sorry, but <laughs> anyway. But any vehicle to achieve spirituality can work. Studying the family proclamation, and we're doing that in July, but don't tell my family. <laughs> Uh, increased reading of the Book of Mormon, doing service, singing hymns, saying consistent family prayers, but you choose. And I testify such intentional efforts will bring your loved ones closer to the Savior. One granddaughter reported, these letters are precious. When the missionaries came over for dinner, they gave a message about the first vision, and my girls, three and five, were asked if they knew anything about it. I prompted them. In the modern world, and they finished by reciting, he and his father appeared to the boy Joseph Smith, ushering in the long-promised dispensation of the fullness of times. Ephesians 1.10. The missionaries' jaws dropped. <laughs> they definitely were not expecting that response. I'm sure three-year-old Sarah and five-year-old Bailey always understood, or did, I'm not sure they always understood, but it has given us something to refer back to and to try to help them make connections all about Jesus Christ. She said it strengthened our family unity. And she, when they were at Disneyland, they were in line, and, and Sarah said, oh, Mom and Dad, let's practice the living Christ. I want to share a few more comments. It was interesting. Brent wrote, Dear Grandpa, I wanted you to know how much we enjoyed learning the living Christ. I was amazed at how well my boys picked it up, and now they are making connections to talks and conference. Another son-in-law wrote, and he, he, his voice broke on. It didn't write, he called, and he started weeping on the phone. And he said, I had never imagined that our lives would be so changed. He said, thank you, thank you for this. Best of all were the comments of a granddaughter who wrote, I learned so much about teaching my children from our experiences memorizing the living Christ. Most importantly, teaching the gospel is an everyday, all-day responsibility, and it doesn't happen unless I specifically choose to teach it. You can sit down with your child the night before their eighth birthday and say, okay, tonight we're going to learn all about the gospel of Jesus Christ. It takes time and repetition, not to mention making connections to their world and life. And I love this because the gospel is personal, not abstract. The side effect of this, of course, is that constantly focusing on Jesus Christ brought the spirit into our day-to-day -day living. For me, my testimony was straightened as I be became more aware than ever. Jesus Christ is the center of everything. The plan of salvation is for all people and for my life personally. Our righteous, intentional parenting resulted in more blessings than we could have imagined. I invite you to connect with Christ-like qualities within you 
to reach out to the needy, the discouraged, and the disenfranchised among us. Brothers and sisters, we have entered a new era, an era that demands the best that we can give, a time that requires we practice true religion, and it's true religion, pure religion, and undefiled is serving the strangers among us. I believe as we engage in this work, our faith will grow and intensify, and we'll have the strength to go ahead. And I feel impressed to tell you, I had a very strong impression, if we choose not to engage, we will not have the strength for what is before us. Before, our religion might have been an academic exercise in many times, but it, in just among our, our own. But something's changed, and the Lord expects us to teach as the Savior taught and be out there with the people. Matthew records the teaching of Christ. Then shall the king Christ say unto them on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was unhungered, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Such service requires intimate association with the Holy Ghost for inspiration and hands-on learning with interaction with those in our midst. I invite you to connect with your fellow men. I'll give just a little background. Um, this is a personal thing, but the Relief Society sisters, you know, um, Sister Burton just gave a talk about us reaching out to the strangers. but. There's a committee, they meet under Elder Oaks, and they said, sisters, what are we gonna do? How are we gonna make a difference? And they fasted, and they prayed, and they came back with that. Since she announced that, it's really interesting, the church has been flooded with phone calls, and people are saying, what do, we, what do you want us to do? Where should we go? And this is the advice, I heard it, I went over there to talk to um, Sharon Eubank, who's in charge. The advice given to those who call is to seek and learn and become more familiar with the Holy Ghost. People are told to get down on their knees and ask Heavenly Father what he desires them to do. When we use our unique talents and means to build the kingdom, we are to listen for direction from the Holy Ghost about where we should go and what we should do. And this, it was interesting, the women over it said, for so many years the church has given clear and precise directives on where to channel our efforts. Now the Lord is asking us to come to him and ask what we are best suited to do and when our efforts are most needed. As we hone those heavenly listening skills and receive inspiration, we gain so much access to God. And I want to read, I wrote this and I want to read it twice. No force on earth can provide service so personalized and powerful. No force on earth can provide service so personalized and powerful. Brothers and sisters, we have that capacity as members, as missionaries, but we have to ask and we have to listen to the spiritual promptings and we have to act. And I love this from Elder, um, you know, do you feel adequate to do this? Sometimes it's so frightening, and, and I love this quote from President Irene. Even the newest member of the church can sense that a call to service should be primarily a matter of the heart. It is by giving our whole hearts to the master and keeping his commandments that we come to know him. What those who are called to serve will need even more than to be trained for their duties is to see with spiritual eyes what it means to be called to serve in the restored church of Jesus Christ. It's a lot more than dropping off donations and contributing and collecting for the needy. We're asked to develop relationships. And this is one thing that was reported has been really hard for people in Salt Lake just to be a friend because people want relationships. Activities that include going to a, a soup kitchen or serving in a food bank or even building a school across the world. People want more than their stomachs fed. They want their souls fed. And often, this is what I'm quoting from Sharon Eubank, often contact with those who need our help most is out of our personal comfort zone. A great blessing for people who actively engage is they get just as much as they give. 
And I want to report to you, we are going back Elder Oaks Prepare. We are adopting a refugee family. Are you ready? I, I, I'll break it. We did, we did adopt one from Burundi about five years ago, and this little boy loved Elder Oaks. And you have to realize, Elder Oaks reads a lot, and he's quite solitary. So, <laughs> um, so I went over to their home, and we'd been there many times, but I went in, and they were opening cans with a knife. And I said, I'm going to get you a can opener. And they go, oh, yeah, we, we've heard about those. So I, I brought one back, and the little boy had run out and gotten in the car with Elder Oaks. And Elder Oaks is reading the newspaper. And I watch, and he puts the paper down. He goes, hi, it's good to see you. And he's hugging him and kissing him. And then um, I, he'd come over to our home for dinner, and he would run up to Elder Oaks Sacred Study and run up and just kiss him all over his head. <laughs> and <laughs> I want you to know they brought so much joy to us. And we're getting a new family, Elder Oaks, so get ready. <laughs> but... The personal things, like helping someone learn to read or singing, there's great power among you, or assisting in an abused women's shelter. We have so many opportunities. We are his hands. Um, as a people, we've been prepared to serve from an early age. This is the hall in the church office building. I took these slides last week. Primary children ages 3 to 12 this last year have been asked to help those around them and record their efforts with helping hands. So, wards across the world have hands of service hanging in their walls adorned with thousands of hands and messages written by children of the service that they rendered. And this is just one wall. If you go into primaries around the world, you'll see walls. From Hong Kong to Orem to Bethesda and Potomac, in Washington, D.C., our little ones have learned to help those around them. And Kathleen talked about patterns. This is a pattern from the time they're toddlers. They move into young women, young men. They go to our universities, our wards, our neighborhoods. They go on missions. We are ready to serve. The Lord has an army. And I say to you, we're assisted with hosts of heaven, this genealogy that we're doing, the impact of it. I think Elder Oak said now that when people go to be baptized, 85% of the youth bring a name that they have researched themselves. We are in new territory, and heaven is helping us. Uh, we can be an example. And I said, well, what's the most important thing that you need? And it was interesting that came back. They said, be an example. I would tell you to start small in your immediate circles. I invite you to have your own personal hands-on experience with charity. These are things written at the April Women's Conference by women in Salt Lake who were asked how they could serve. I will learn the names of all the families on my street. I will try to talk to every person I observe who might need help and seek inspiration to know what they might need. But the very favorite is on the bottom it says, I'm going to have my mom with Alzheimer's move into my home. She's a refugee in her own body. Brothers and sisters, we can start small. We can start in our own families. We don't have to go across the world. And I'm hoping some of you after today will want to go across the world. But any effort that we make is enough. From our personal circles, we move to, we move to communities in crisis around us. Mormon Helping Hands. I didn't realize this. Helping Hands was actually established in South America in 1998. And since then, hundreds of thousands of volunteers, Mormon and non-Mormon, and that's been the strength of us. They brought the communities together. It started in South America and has spread to nearly every corner of the world. The resources come from Church Humanitarian, and then the energy comes from the local church leaders from El Salvador to Costa Rica, Germany to New Jersey, Africa to Brazil. Members have donated time and effort. For our own Katrina, they came. Now, as never before, we have another new problem, and the church is being proactive. We have a great tide of displaced Christians from Syria and other countries in the Middle East. There are needs to build schools, train teachers, and provide assistance, including the teaching of reading and providing recreational play. 
they sent me a slew of pictures and I put them in and Elder Oak said no. He said, you pick one, one that tells your story and one that will really touch people's hearts. And I think of the Knights here and I think of Miss Kathleen. I think one woman, and when she talks of you, have you noticed how she sees your strength? There's never been a greater singer, a great piano player, and ever speech writer. She has seen this, and Glade has too, with his cowboy ethics. It's just the one. You know, when you really touch someone where it counts, it makes a difference. And for me, those are mothers. You're looking at a picture of a Jordanian refugee camp, and their mothers actually learning to speak very simple English and learning numeracy, and I would probably put money down that many of these women have not had the privilege of education. It's a recent photo of them, and such educational opportunity is the key that will unlock their lives. Um, I want my voice to be their voice, and it, I plea with you for these women who come to you as learners in process, with a hunger for truth, and a desire to build a better future they bring a womanly perspective, the hearts of mothers, and the desire to be better teachers. And I believe it is our responsibility to help them. Um, Catherine Thomas wrote a book called The God Seed and about how we, that's so unique to our religion and for so many hard to grasp that we are the literal children of God and will become as he does. But opportunities such as these to put our faith in action can only cement and enhance our spirituality. Catherine Thomas observed, celestial beings do not make a distinction between theory and practice. They become a personification of what they teach. They develop unshakable confidence of goodness as a way of life. They practice until they actually become one with these godly characteristics. Brothers and sisters, we have before us a time never before. And it's a time to practice pure religion, which is obviously visiting the widows and the fatherless. But we have a world obligation. And I believe that our church is probably the most capable organization to do it. And we've been prepared forever. Every time you take the sacrament, you take upon yourself the name of Jesus Christ, and he seals you his. May your efforts to connect with the best within you and to develop Christ-like attributes be successful so that his image may be engraven in your countenance. Did you hear that when Elder Packer was talking? In that? So that his image may be engraven in your countenance and his attributes manifest in your behavior. I would like to ask Elder Oaks up to give some closing remarks. And I just want you to know I love you. And I say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm sure you've concluded from what you've heard that I married up. <laughs> That's the, the happy aspiration of every man, to find a, a woman who will make him better than he is capable of being on his own. Thank you, Kristen, for your very careful uh, thorough, uh, lengthy, and apprehensive preparation. <laughs> I'm a, uh, a witness to all of that, and thank you, thank you. Um, as I read the, the uh, early history of Brigham Young University, I saw a great emphasis on three words, the head, the heart, the hand as a way of expressing what, what we are and what we do. The head, the heart, the hand. In our family, since my marriage to Kristen, which was 16 years ago this coming August, uh, I continue to be the head, but she's obviously the heart and the hand. And you can tell that uh, she has had a 
profound influence on my life and I love her very much and, and I respect her and honor her and uh, I don't want to say anything that would detract from the excellence of her message but I, I thought I would just share two things that seem to me to fit within the message she has delivered. One is uh, what a patriarchal blessing is. Now, almost all of us in this audience have had a patriarchal blessing. You know, we have descendants that are desiring or qualifying or scheduling a patriarchal blessing. A patriarchal blessing in the context of what Kristen has been teaching us is personal scripture. It is very much scripture, but unlike what we have as the standard works, it's very personal. We're even counseled not to share it, not to put it in talks, not to read it to others. It's personal scripture and it is to be interpreted like the standard works under the influence of the Holy Ghost. I received a patriarchal blessing when I was 16 years old. I remember that my widowed mother, who was employed and busy earning a, a living, uh, did not go with me, and I'd never been to this patriarch's home. He didn't know me. I went in and his wife was a scribe and she took down the blessing and later I received a copy of it and read it and put it away and then some years later I read it again and years after that I read it again and it was a new blessing each time I read it because my maturity had enhanced, my closeness to the Holy Ghost had increased and I realized how very significant the blessing was that I received from a patriarch who did not know me. Uh, and I was a 16-year-old boy. Uh, and still that, that blessing is precious personal scripture. That's one way to guide our life. A second thing I, I would share with you before bearing my testimony is how I begin my day. Uh, I wake up usually at 4.30, never later than 5, and I can't go back to sleep. And I prepare for the day. Uh, the first thing I do is put on clothes and go out and walk a couple of miles. And Kristen often walks with me, sometimes I walk with others, but I found that exercising in the morning increases my uh, reception of the guidance of the Holy Ghost. It also keeps my body and my mind working. And then when I, I come back, I, I get ready for the day and I read the scriptures. I do it in the morning because I can't stay awake at night. I'm, I, I want to read the scriptures when I'm alert. And then I pray. Uh, I pray before I read the scriptures. And I, what I pray for is that the, I'll have the Spirit of the Lord to guide me, to illuminate my mind as I read the scriptures, not just for the meaning of what I'm reading, but the scriptures are a personal Urim and Thummim. If you read them prayerfully, they're a way of receiving revelation. And I pray for that to guide me in all the decisions of the day. And then uh, I wake Kristen up. <laughs> well, it's 6.30. It's not late. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I, I go, I get up earlier in the morning than she does, and she works later at night than I do. We have the same basically the same work day, but it, it's arranged a little differently. <laughs> anyway, I, I wake her up and then 
she uh, and I have a quick breakfast together and we usually go out of the house at about the same time. But the other thing I would tell you is that family prayer is very important. And Kristen is the, the, the enforcement mechanism for family prayer. Because with what I've already done, I can forget family prayer. And it's not at all unusual for her to chase me down the hall after I've gone out the door and summon me back to have family prayer. It's not that I don't value it, but I've been praying and studying all morning, and so I'm susceptible to forget it. <laughs> and in that, in so many other ways, she enriches my life, and I thank the Lord for her. And I'll, I'll just say that after my wife June died, uh, it was two years. Uh, on the month that was the second anniversary of my my wife's death, that I first heard the name Kristen McMain. I'd never met her, never heard of her. The Lord led me to her through a miraculous circumstance, and, and we were married later that same summer because I could recognize that the Lord had brought her into my life to help me in my ministry and to take charge of our family. And so she became an instant mother grandmother and great-grandmother at that point, and she's loved by three generations, and you can see why. Brothers and sisters, this is the church of Jesus Christ. I testify of him. I testify of the name of Jesus Christ, which means his authority and his atonement, his ministry, and his essence because it is the destiny of the children of God to see him and to be like him when we see him. The scriptures teach that, but it's not understood by the world. That's a, a Bible teaching that, that had to be illuminated by the, the restoration and the, uh, the revelations that came with it. I testify that we are children of God and as Kristen has been telling you from the testimony glove, we have a heavenly father who loves us. He loves all of us, not just the members of the church, not just the people who keep his commandments. He loves everybody. And because he loves us, he wants us to have what he has. And that's why we have Jesus Christ to succor us when we're in distress. He's experienced all of the challenges of mortality as we read in Alma 7:11, he, if we'll just ask and reach out for him, he's been through it all. He knows how to get us through the challenges of mortality. And then we have the Holy Ghost who testifies of the Father and the Son and who leads us into truth and who is the agency of the inspiration that we pray for and the testimony and strength that we seek to get us through the challenges of mortality. I testify of all of these things and as a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, bless you and invoke his blessings upon you as you seek to serve him. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen.